Let's turn in our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61 is going to be the passage that we'll be focusing on uh, this morning. I do want to say that uh, in addition to seeing God's people here who regularly meet here, those who are visiting and guests with us, it's always encouraging when God's people seek out one another, even when they're traveling. And also, Sister Nadine, it's a blessing to see you back with us. And it's encouragement uh, to, to everyone here. And that's a special gift uh, that God has brought you back with us here. Now, we're taught when we are children or when we are maybe introducing the Bible, the New Testament, to uh, those who would learn about it, the different kinds of books of the Bible that we have in the New Testament. You know, we have Gospels. We have a book of history. We have the letters of Paul. And then we have a book of prophecy or apocalyptic literature at the very end uh, with the book of Revelation. And when we're taught then about the Gospels, we're taught that there are how many Gospels? Four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that these are Gospels because they contain Jesus sharing the good news, and that is the Gospel. These are four books that tell us about the work of Jesus, His credentials as the Messiah, the record of His deeds among the people, His miracles, His teaching, and they are given so that, number one, we would believe that Jesus was who He said He was, that He was who the apostles said He was. But the Gospels are not only for us to believe into Jesus, but they serve as a blueprint or a pattern for our daily living. In other words, we are to imitate our Master, what He said, how He interacted with people, and this is one of the purposes of the Gospels as well. Can I submit to you that while that is certainly true, there is a sense in which there is a fifth Gospel in the Bible. And it's one that we often don't think of, and that's the prophet Isaiah. And I would say that we learn just about as much about Jesus, His work, His mission, His attitude, His dealings with others, and His commitment to His Father than we read in, in any of the other four Gospels. And so certainly, yes, we have four Gospels, but I think there's a sense in which we might think of Isaiah as the fifth one. And so what I would like to do this morning is to take a look at Isaiah chapter 61 and I'd like for us to think about Isaiah chapter 61 from the perspective of a description of Christians that are found there. That is, trees of righteousness. Some of your translations might read oaks of righteousness. Uh, however, we're going to be proceeding with my new King James, trees of righteousness. What I'd like to do in this lesson is to think, first of all, very quickly about the setting of Isaiah, what this prophet's mission was, and to see how chapter 61 fits into that primary mission. Then I'd like for us to take our time going through this chapter and meditating upon what it means for us to adopt the identity as trees of righteousness. And really the perspective that I'm adopting with this lesson is this. It is always healthy and beneficial and a blessing to us if we will just stop and just soak in the beauties and the sublimity of God's Word. Problems with temptation, problems with having zeal, problems with purity of doctrine or of my conduct so often are addressed if we will simply slow down and take the time to soak and meditate in God's wonderful message like Isaiah 61. So first of all, I'd like for us to think about the setting of the prophet Isaiah and his work. Roughly between the years 740 and 700 would be when Isaiah was prophesying. We're given the time stamp of his prophecy, like so many of the prophets, in chapter 1 and verse 1 of his prophecy. And if you look back to the books of 2 Kings and of 2 Chronicles, we read about the kingdoms of Israel and Judah and their spiritual condition when Isaiah was prophesying. And as a general rule, the spiritual condition of the people was abject. They were impoverished spiritually because they had become more faithful and loyal to the idols and the religious cults of the nations around them than they were loyal to the covenant that God had made with them at Sinai. And so as Isaiah is coming to the people at this very dark period of their history, the focus and the kernel of his message 
is a refrain that you see over and over and over in Isaiah, and that is he is reminding them about the identity of God. And throughout Isaiah, God is pictured again and again as the Holy One of Israel. Really, the, the, the core message, the platform of Isaiah is really found in chapter 6 when he sees the vision of God on his throne and he is proclaimed thrice as the Holy One. Holy, holy, holy. God then sends Isaiah to give the message of coming destruction for the nation that refuses to hear the Holy One of Israel. And certainly this was the side of God that the people desperately needed to be reminded of. They had lost sight of God's holiness and they were treating God like they were treating all the other gods in their mind around them. And so Isaiah's message is that of number one, judgment, because you've forgotten the Holy One of Israel. But also there are scenes of hope throughout the book as well. And as we get especially toward the second part or section of the book of Isaiah, especially beginning in chapter 40, we start getting glimpses and, and, and clear focus about a coming servant who would come to execute a mission that no one else could do and that would reunite or that is reconcile the people of Israel with their God once again. And so repeatedly in the second section, in chapters 42... 49, 50, and then the end of 52 leading into 53, we get a picture of a servant that's coming. And what we learn about this servant is he's going to suffer. He is going to go through excruciating pain and difficulties and trials, but he's going to do it to redeem God's people back to himself. And that by his executing the mission he was sent for, he would make it possible for God's people to be blessed spiritually. And certainly this is a foreshadowing of Jesus, the coming suffering servant. And so what we have then as we get to chapter 61 of Isaiah, the servant himself speaks up and he addresses God's people with a message of joy about what he gets to do as the servant of God. And so that then takes us to chapter 61. I'd like for us to take our time to read through this chapter in these three main sections and to reflect about what it tells us not only about this joyful servant now, who is not suffering so much now in this chapter. He's jubilant. And I want us to reflect upon the blessings that we enjoy because of what this servant has done for us. So let's begin reading then in chapter 61 and verse 1. Notice the servant himself speaks up. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Now, in verse 1, when he says, I'm coming to preach good tidings, to proclaim, again, liberty or freedom to the captives. I think it's important for us, first of all, to understand that here the servant is hearkening back to a special moment in the Jews' religious year, and that would be the year of Jubilee. If you want to put your marker or hold your place here, let's turn back in our Bibles to Leviticus chapter 25. In Leviticus 25, we are given here instructions about how the Jews would carry out and celebrate this year of Jubilee. In chapter 25, we're told beginning in verse 8. And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years, and the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you, 49 years. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall make the trumpet sound 
throughout all your land, and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. That 50th year shall be a jubilee to you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of its own accord, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine. It, for it is the jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat its produce from the field. So, we could go on and keep reading about some of the other points that were to be made during the year of jubilee, but it is essentially this. It is a year of celebration of freedom, and freedom in a number of respects. So what they were to do was they were to count seven Sabbaths of years. That is to say, seven times seven. So they were to count 49 years. And then once that was over, at the beginning of that 50th year, on the Day of Atonement, the great high day of the religious calendar, they were to sound the horn and to announce that this was now the year of Jubilee. And the idea of jubilee comes from the word for a ram's horn. So it's the blast on a ram's horn, celebrating this announcement of liberty. And there was liberty in three respects for the people. Number one, it was liberty to those Jews who, because of poverty, had indentured themselves to serve someone else. In the 50th year, regardless of the debt, regardless of the situation, they were pronounced free. Secondly, the land was to go back to its original owner. If for some reason land was leased to someone else in the 50th year, it would go back to its original owner. And the idea is that God is protecting and, uh, uh, and is establishing tribal allotment and tribal uh, uh, a land territory uh, throughout the land. But thirdly, what was to happen is that the land itself was to have a form of freedom. Notice they weren't to work the land. They weren't to cultivate the land in this year. They were to enjoy what was reaped that year before. And whatever then grew for them in that year was to be their provision that God would provide for them. So it was liberty from slavery, liberty from debt. And it was liberty then for the land itself. And it was God's reminder to them that you, nation, find your true freedom and liberty in me. I am the one that provides and I am your Savior ultimately. And so now as we go back then to Isaiah chapter 61, here is the servant of the Lord that speaks and he says, I have wonderful news. I am now proclaiming that this is a year of jubilee. But the point I want to make and that we will continually make in this lesson is that chapter 61 can only be understood and it can only find its true fulfillment in the era of the Christ and the era of the kingdom. And so this is the blessing that Christians can enjoy. And the idea is that he now comes to proclaim liberty, but liberty to whom? Notice in verse 1, it's to the poor, the brokenhearted, the captive, those who are bound. And as we'll later see in the New Testament, it would include those who are blind. So how do you describe these people? These are the groups that are so often ignored and the groups that are not given the attention that the rest of the world might get sometimes. And the idea is that when Jesus came, His message was not for the religious elite. Now, it was for them in a sense, but they wouldn't listen to it. Jesus came and He spoke to the common people and the common people heard Him gladly. He came and He spoke to the poor, to the simple, those who were in need of the Gospel and understood that need for it. And His announcement was that of liberty. And His announcement rings true through all the ages that for those who are impoverished spiritually, those who are enslaved to sin, those who have spiritual blindness and maladies can now enjoy freedom and health and release in Him. That spiritually we need not be ruled by sin anymore. And the Messiah is coming to announce that. And I want you to notice also what is phrased in verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Or He has Messiahed me. He had made me Christ. And the idea here is that God has chosen him for a special task. And I want you to notice the attitude with which 
the Messiah or the servant approaches this task. He has sent me to preach good tidings, to comfort, to proclaim, to console. I want you to think about it from this perspective. Isn't it a good feeling when you've received a bit of good news and you know that there is someone for whom that news will mean all the world? When you get to go and tell that person, whether it's a letter or an email, a text, or a face-to-face -face interaction, all right, you're almost already smiling as you begin to open your mouth because you know what's this, what this is going to mean for that person. You know this is going to change their life and mean so much to them. And you get positive self-gratification from being able to share that message. Isn't it wonderful to think about the kind of joy that Jesus had as even ages before He came, He contemplated the wonderful news that He was going to share with us. I think that's a special thing to think about. But then finally, I want us to think about this passage in verse 3. What do these free individuals now get to be called? Trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that He may be glorified. You know what the idea of a tree raises in my mind? I think there are kind of two ideas here. Number one, what are trees for, essentially? Among many things, they provide fruit. Now, it may not necessarily be fruit that would be edible to us, but it would be fruit that would either be edible to us or edible to animal life, to birds. In other words, they bear fruit. And the idea here is that those who were poor and sick and lame, and helpless, and absolutely useless to anyone, God injected and invested immense value in them, and He can make them fruitful. And what a wonderful lesson when we realize that as a sinner, without God's salvation, I'm useless to Him. And He knows that. But He takes me and He makes me useful. And the idea is that I can be a tree of righteousness and I can be fruitful for Him and His cause. But there's a second idea behind the tree here. Now, I think the idea behind a tree, especially an oak of righteousness, as some of your versions have it, is that it is stable. You can imagine this massive tree, an oak, who that has spread its roots deep and far and wide. And it has no fear when the heat of summer comes, because its roots are deep and it accesses the nutrients it needs to. The storms of life come by. There are troubles. Things come and go. This tree stands firm because it's rooted in that which is secure. And what a blessing for those who are unstable, those who spiritually and in Jesus' day, politically had the ground moving beneath them constantly to know that you can find stability and rest and security in your relationship with the Lord. What a wonderful blessing that's announced here, that we can be trees of righteousness. But he goes on and he describes further what these trees of righteousness are going to be like. He uses other images or other metaphors to describe their new identity in him. Let's go on reading then in verses 4 through 9. And they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the foreigner shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be named the priests of the Lord, they shall call you the servants of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor, and instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double, everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice, I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth and will make with them an everlasting covenant. Their descendants shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring among the people. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are the posterity whom the Lord has blessed. 
What are the three new identities that these released free captives now share in their freedom? Not only are they, tre- are they trees of righteousness with fruit and stability, but look at the other three descriptions of them. In verse um, 6, they shall be named priests of the Lord. Now, for the nation of Israel, for the nation of Judah at this point, and throughout God's, uh, the, the history of God's people, the priests were a special family. The priests were the descendants of Aaron, and there would be the high priest that would run through his line. Now, certainly the tribe of Levi were given that they would be the attendants and ministers for the holy things, but the actual office of a priest was for Aaron and then his male descendants. But he's not here contradicting the law. He is truly here reminding the people that this coming spiritual generation of his people would ultimately fulfill what God had in mind all the way back at Sinai. If you remember when they were brought to Sinai in Exodus chapter 19, God told them through Moses, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be to me a special treasure above all peoples, for all the world is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the people of Israel. So what we're told there in Exodus 19, 4 through 6, is precisely now what the servant of the Lord is announcing to His coming people, that you will truly fulfill what God envisioned for His people back at Sinai. The idea of a priest is that you serve as a go-between between God and the people. That you identify with God and that you're His specially commissioned servant. You identify with the people because you are one of them. And the idea is that you can serve as a mediator. And especially in the form of the high priest was this mediation realized. To offer sacrifices on behalf of the people to appease God and to take God's message and His vision of the spiritual condition of the people and imprint that upon the nation themselves. But what God said at Sinai was, it's not so much that I want one family, and yes, He expected them strictly to observe those commands, but in a spiritual condition, He wanted the nation itself to be priests. Now what did that mean for Israel? He wanted Israel to serve for the world what an individual priest did for the people of Israel. In other words, he wanted the nation of Israel, the whole nation itself, to so embody the character of God and to show people that, yes, you can come through us to come to know the Father. He wanted the nation to attract the Gentiles so that they could come and understand who the Creator was. But so sadly, they did not appreciate nor fulfill that mission. And so now the suffering servant announces the joyous news that you will be priest to God. Can we hold our places here again? Let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2. And the point that I'm trying to make is what God says there back in Isaiah 61 for everyone sitting here in this room right now. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. And this is brought home in 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's turn over to 1 Peter 2, 2, and let's notice verse 9. So listen, Christian. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now, of all the network of Old Testament passages that are mentioned here, I want us to focus on the fact that this is the fulfillment of Isaiah 61. So you, Christian, are a priest. What a wonderful privilege that is. But I would warn you and advise you that God does not appoint us to be priests to Him in this new kingdom simply as an honorary title. We are priests with responsibilities. 
And it would lie to a lesson for another time to go through those responsibilities, but it requires of us holiness, the offering of sacrifices, and imprinting God's nature and character and showing it, declaring it to a lost world. We have responsibilities as priests. So in other words, we can't take Isaiah 61 and say, wow, this is wonderful. We can just enjoy these blessings at our ease. No, it requires action daily on my part. But we're not only priests. Going back to Isaiah 61, what are the trees now in the new covenant? You're a priest, but you're also, in verse 6, what? The servants of our God. Now remember, as I said in Isaiah chapter, really especially chapters 42, 49, 50, and then 52 and 53, servant means something very powerful. Now there's a sense in which here, of course we cannot be servants in the same way that Jesus was because He had a service to do that no one in heaven or on earth could do but Him. And praise be to Him for that. But when He calls us to be servants, we need to understand that servants serve. And it reminds me of that song that we so often sing, the servant song that we'll call it, Make Me a Servant Just Like Your Son. Can I say something about that and connect that song to this mention here? I think it's the same point. Yes, it's wonderful for us, Make Me a Servant. It's wonderful for us to read this and to just bask in how special it is that we can be servants of God. But when you read through Isaiah and you see what service to God requires, it requires everything from you. It will cost you everything. You look at the suffering servant and he gave everything. And so when we are servants of God, tremendous blessing, but it also requires tremendous sacrifice. And we find blessing in the sacrifice as well. But thirdly, what do we read in this passage? We are priests, we are servants. And even though he doesn't state it directly, I would say he's describing you are now firstborn. Do you remember in the inheritance laws of the Old Covenant, a special position was reserved for the firstborn son. The firstborn son carried on the name and the kind of spiritual authoritative position that his father had. The firstborn carries that on. But also the firstborn enjoyed a double portion of the inheritance. And that wasn't just so much an honorary thing to say, yeah, you're the firstborn, you won the lottery, so to speak, good for you. No, the double portion was so that the firstborn could truly be the provider for the family. In other words, he has the resources to serve as the firstborn. And so we read here, clearly there's the language of the firstborn, especially in verse 6 at the end. And then in verse 7, talking about the double honor and the double possession. And the idea is that as God views the nations... The Gentiles, he views Israel and he says, you're my firstborn among them. I'm giving you the double portion. And certainly here, obviously, the idea is that as Christians, as the new spiritual Israel, God gives us a special position in his family and he gives us the resources to thrive and to serve in that special privilege. But here, Israel is pictured as being firstborn in relation to the nations, Notice in verse 5, strangers will tend your flocks, plowmen will be among the foreigners for you. In other words, Israel, you're not the doormat anymore. You're not going to be carried off captive anymore. Now, was this the physical fulfillment politically for Israel? Absolutely not. By the time Jesus comes on the scene, there's another empire, yet again, that's over them. We can only find spiritual fulfillment in this. These are figures to show a spiritual reality. And the idea that he's being speaking, spoken of here is that the world need not conquer and dominate God's people. And instead, God's people are the privileged. They are among the firstborn. And the idea here is not so we can take that and say, let's just hoard it and keep it to ourselves and just look with disdain upon the, the rest of the world. No, we have then the opportunity to invite and to appeal to others 
to come into that special relationship with God. What a wonderful scripture to talk about our identity as God's people. Why would we walk around just kind of wringing our hands and just muttering about you know, how afflicted and what a terrible state the world is for God's people? We're not blind to the evils in this world, but by all means, we are more than conquerors in Him who loved us. We should have boldness and confidence and joy and peace, not because it arises out of ourselves, but we're trees of God's righteousness. The stability that salvation in His Son provides. But let's go on and read then, beginning in verse 10, and we read the end of what the servant has to say about this wonderful moment when he proclaims liberty. In verse 10, he says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Now, some read this and they take it that the spokesman has changed and that it is the worshiper or the citizen of this new liberty that's speaking up. I think it's unclear. I tend to see that it is still the servant speaking, and I see no contradiction there. So that's how at least we'll proceed at this point. But I think either way, we don't run into problems with the text. But I believe that here, finally, the servant is saying that in view of the special news that I get to announce, and that I myself am the one that is accomplishing this, he says, I greatly rejoice in the Lord. And he rests and joys in God. Why? I believe here he's saying that God has fitted him or prepared him for this special proclamation. And as he describes it in verse 10, a robe of righteousness, so often in the scriptures, both old and new, the idea of clothing and clothing that God provides is a sign of God's favor and as God's provisions for us. But take off the old man and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We find this language so often in the Scriptures. But notice here in verse 10, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Now again, whether we're talking about the servant himself speaking up and saying this or God's people who enjoy the blessings, either way, this kind of analogy here I think is so special and powerful. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. As I read that, I can't help but reflect that a year ago, this coming Saturday, I was that bridegroom. And I remember that day. And I can't say I was decked out very well, but I tried. (laughs) But the point that I'm being made is you capture... The anticipation, the joy, and there's joy in the fact that this is meant to last. And you look down and you see how your bride has adorned herself. That's special. And to think that God views my relationship with Him like that. Why can't I give him my life joyfully every day to repay the value that he has placed upon me? And to think that that is just a foreshadowing of when Jesus returns, our bridegroom, and when he brings us to be with him for eternity, that lasts. And to see the anticipation and the joy and for all that Jesus had to suffer, that was it. And I can now spend my life with nothing held back to give Him what He has given me. 
He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the, year, the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. The idea here is that in the dry, cracked, barren earth that was Israel, physically, God would bring forth a shoot from the cut-off stump of Jesse to be the Messiah, and from Him, we all can branch out as trees of righteousness that are fruitful. And the idea is that from a barren, unfruitful, sin-sick heart, the message of the cross can touch us, and God can cause even from pitiful, sinful us, that we can be redeemed, and God can cause righteousness and praise to Him to come forth out of us. And what a wonderful blessing it is that we as God's children then can be His trees of righteousness. That the Lord may be glorified. Now, we're done here in Isaiah 61, but we've got one last stop we've got to make. Let's turn over in our Bibles to Luke chapter 4. Let's look in Luke chapter 4. Let's begin reading together in verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then He closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue, were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Wonderful moment in time. When finally the suffering servant came. And as he was in the beginning stages of this earthly ministry, in which he would give us everything. He opens in a synagogue in Nazareth the very reading that we just meditated on. And he said, now it's time. Now it's fulfilled. And you can capture the great joy with which Jesus could say this. And which echoes now through eternity and which we get to enjoy. But I want to make a point here as well. If you go back and you compare Isaiah 61 uh, 61 with what Jesus read and quoted from it, do you realize where he stopped? If he had read the next phrase, what would it have been? To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. And in this moment, he actually announced to the people of Nazareth, in essence, you're not going to accept me. And I'm going to turn to the Gentiles and they will hear and they will come and they will enjoy the blessings, so to speak, of Isaiah 61. But he was announcing to his own people that by and large, my own people will reject me. And so that's where Isaiah 61 now touches you and it touches me. Is it going to be a tree of righteousness for me? Or is it going to be a day of vengeance of our God for me? And what I'd like for us to do now as we begin to close this service and as we are ready to sing the song, what will your answer be? What will you say before the great judge who came to give you everything? When he comes and when you appear before him, is this going to be that one a wonderful moment that we were just imagining of the bridegroom and the bride? Here is the one who planted the trees and now he brings the trees home with him. 
Or is it going to be for us a day of vengeance of our God? Because if we have looked at the wonderful blessings and privileges and the freedom that God has offered us, and if we reject that liberty and jubilee and instead we choose a fleeting life of sin and of slavery, it will indeed be a day, a never-ending day. Rather, a night of vengeance of God. And I get to choose. And so, I encourage you to reflect upon your soul's condition before God right now. And that if there's something that's between you and Him, whether it's making it known so that we can strengthen you and help you, or whether it's privately praying to God, begging for forgiveness, make it right with Him so that you can live out in your life the wonderful plans that He has for you. If you wish to become a Christian, and based upon your faith and conviction in Christ, you would confess your sins and your faith in Him. And if you will turn from sin completely and be immersed in water to rise a new person and then proceed to walk in this new life, you will be saved. And we would love to see that and to witness and to help you with that this morning. And so I would call upon you that if in any way you can respond to this, that you would do so. And let us know if we can help. But now let's stand and let's sing this song to encourage one another.